Amen. God bless you all this morning. I do want to make a note that uh, it is a little icy outside, so be careful. I threw two, two pounds of salt out there, but I don't should buy about some more. So let us all stand and we'll open our service this morning with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we appreciate the chance to gather with you this morning, Father, in your house. And Lord, we have great expectations of uh, what you have for us in your word this morning, Father. Help us to put ourselves aside, Lord, and to put you first, Lord, in our minds. And Lord, help us to keep our thoughts clear and focused on you this morning is our prayer. Lord, we just ask that you would be with us in our service. Everything that's done and said this morning, may it be glorifying to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Amen. God bless you all this morning. Do you want to make song? a God is it, good. It is a little icy outside. All the time. I threw two, two pounds of salt out there, but I should buy about some more. So God is good. Our service this morning. All the time. <laughs> He put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good all the time. Through the darkest night, His light will shine. God is good. God is good all the time. If you're walking through the valley and there's shadows all around, do not fear, for He will guide you. He will keep you safe and sound. Cause He's promised to never leave you nor forsake you. And his word is true, God is true, his life all the time, God is true. Put a song of praise in this heart of mine, God is good all the time. If you're walking through the darkest night, his life will shine, God is good. God is good, do not fear, for he will guide you. We were sinners, so unworthy, still for us he chose to die. Filled us with his Holy Spirit, now we can stand and testify that his love is and his words on trees, they will never end. God is good all the time. But a song of praise in this heart of mine, God is good all the time. Through the darkest night, his light will shine. God is still for us. God is good all the time. Filled us with His Holy Spirit. Now we can stand and witness that His love is everlasting. And His words on trees, they will never end. God is good all the time. Australia had surgery on Monday, and that was a 
week ago, so we went to the opera for the 20 assistant Japanese series of snakes on the evening of that one. God is Collins family, the Dolly family for healing of the heart and uh, their situation of loss of loved ones and uh, healing for Brother John McCray, Brother Joe White, Brother Brian Chips, Brother Caldwell in Oregon, Brother Frongus in Australia and Brother Mabuka in Congo and then also for the many needs in India and Uganda. All our unspoken prayer requests this morning can be known by an uplifted hand and we'll go take this, uh, these requests before the Lord. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we know that uh, your prophet in the Bible says that Satan would be roaming the earth, Lord, to and fro, just to see who he could devour, Father. And Lord, in some of this uh, unfortunate cool weather that we've had, Father, Lord, we have had some families come with uh, down with the sickness, Father. And Lord, we just ask that you would touch them and their family this morning, Lord, Brother Walter and Sister Sandra this morning, and for whoever may not be feeling well this morning, Father, we ask, Lord, that you would touch the body of your people, Father, and make them fully whole, bring them out of the sickness that they're in, Father, and for those that need healing, Lord, and in the heart, Lord, and the loss of their loved ones, Father, time will only heal that, Father, but knowing most of all that we'll see them again on the other side, Father. Lord, we just ask that you would be with us today in this service, Father. Help us to move ourselves aside, Lord. And as your prophet said, we could never pray too much. And Lord, we could never ask for too much revelation. So this morning we ask that you would give us the revelation of your word, Lord. And Lord, open it up to us a little bit more, Lord. And as we are humans, Father, we have constant need of reminders. And so, Lord, when we do hear something that we've heard before, Lord, quicken it to us and make it alive to us once again, Father, is our prayer. Be with us in our song service, Father, and those that are here and those that may have lifted their hands that we're watching this morning, Father, may you grant it and be their portion this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing that uh, song, I am the God that healeth thee. <clears throat> I am the God that healeth thee. I am the Lord your healer. I sent my word and I healed your disease. I am the Lord your healer. I am the God that healeth thee. I am the Lord, your healer. I sent my word and I healed your disease. I am the Lord, your healer. You are the God that healeth me. You are the Lord, my healer. You sent your word and you healed my disease. You are the Lord, my healer. You are the God that healeth me. You are the Lord, my healer. You sent your word and you healed my disease. You are the Lord, my healer. Amen. Brother Steve, if you would come. Brother Don, if you would give him a hand this morning with a tithe and offering. We'll go ahead and take that up. <clears throat> Amen. Brother Don, would you ask the Lord's blessing this morning? Amen. 
number <coughs> excuse me number 266 in the Alma Believe book because he lives <coughs> I can face tomorrow God said his son they call him Jesus he came to us heal and He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives because he lives. I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future, and life is worth the living just because he lives and then one day I'll cross that river I'll fight life's fight no war with pain and then as death gives way to victory I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he reigns because he lives I can face tomorrow because he All fear is gone Because I know He holds the future And life is worth the living Just because He lives Amen. Are you thankful that He lives? paid that price for us. Amen. God bless you this morning. Let us all stand and we change the order of service. <clears throat> Only believe. Only believe. All things are possible. Only Now that you're here, Jesus, you're here, Jesus, you're here, and all things are possible now that you're here. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Father, we are such a privileged people, O oh God, to still have this opportunity in this great country to come and worship you in spirit and truth. And Father, we would ask you, O oh God, to help us, knowing, Father, that we are just a needy people. And Father, we see the life of Christ that was reflected in your prophet, and we so desire to have that same life reflecting in us. And so, Father, we know that 
that only you can do it. For it's not something that we can do, O oh God, but it's something that you're working in us to will and to do. And so help us, O oh God, to learn to Thank yield. You, Father, we are such in a Jesus privileged name people, O oh God, to Amen. still have this opportunity in this great country to come this morning and we're worship you in spirit and truth. And Father, we in this would ask you, O oh God, to help us. His ability Father, to that yield yourself we are just to God, the people. ability to get yourself and Father, we out of see the, way. the life of Christ. That now, God promised us that we would be given power through the so gift desire of to have yield ourselves life, to the revelation of Jesus Christ in us. And so, and Father, surrender our own will to the will of the Father, just as Jesus laid down His own life. Only You can do it to the Father's will. Of course, not something that we can do. Now, what do you mean by this? But it's something that I mean that God has given every son of God by way of the Holy Spirit in God. To learn to use a very Father, special gift that he has given to all to sons God, to, to be able to get Amen. yourself out of the way. way. That's what Jesus, as the firstborn son, and thus the pattern for all sons, was able to do. And learning from the firstborn son of God, and knowing we are ordained to come into his image, then we must also become like him, and thus in order to do so, God has given each of us the same gift that he gave his son, and that's the Holy Ghost. He's given it to us by measure. That's why we struggle more, perhaps, than he did. But nevertheless, we have that same gift within us. And now maybe you don't think so, but that is because you don't know what that gift is. The gift to get yourself out of the way is the gift of God's Holy Spirit living in you. And the more you become aware of the God life in you, the easier it is to stand aside and let God be God. And let his spirit have the preeminence in your thoughts, in your speech, in your act, life and actions that stem from yielding to his spirit that lives in you. Now from his sermon, Spoken Word is Original Seed, Brother Branham said, the, the Bible's got to be in you. You know, many people can quote the Bible. And I remember sitting one time, and maybe not to get off my nose, but we're sitting there with Levon's dad, and uh, there's a local He's Assemblies of God preacher by That's why we came by and Perhaps and he and did, this guy was a, just a piece of work, and, uh, and I don't mean to be disparaging. And now maybe anybody, you don't think so, but he would say that is because you don't. Well, know Hebrews five and twelve gift says, gift and the gift you get yourself about, out of the way is talking the gift about, of God's say, Holy Spirit. And John fifteen and four and says, says you know, I'm just kind of like a preacher you, voice, and <clears> so the next time he, I just determined myself, I was just going to put a little into that. So the next time he said a scripture, I said no, it doesn't. That stem from, and he was flustered because he didn't really know if he was right or not. Lives in you. And that's the problem, is that word is original seed, it's not Adam a false the, humility. The Bible's got God, to be in God, you. God you know, hates many people a false quote the Bible. humility. And I remember sitting he hates one time, a put on. maybe not to get off my nose, You've got to be yourself sitting by there with grace. Levon's dad and... Uh, so he says the Bible's got to be in you. God preacher, measure, the word's a seed, and as long as it's laying here, and it won't was a, do nothing. Work and, uh, yeah. But when it comes here, now, in here, so, when it comes in the say, heart, then it begins to manifest by the Holy Spirit the works of God. Then visions, then visions come, and power comes, and humility comes. It's not getting humility, and then you get. So the next time he, I just determined myself. It's not getting humility, and then. So the next time he said a scripture, I said, "No, it all begins." That stem from, and he was flushed. Because he didn't really it all begins. Right now. Otherwise, if you got like that's the problem. It's not a false humility. The Bible's got it's not a false humility. humility. God is God is false humility. God hates you know, a false. Quote the Bible. It's a true humility. You can only come through the Maybe word of God. Nose, You've got to be yourself. By there with he says, then visions come. So he says the Bible's got to be. Then power comes. Then humility comes. All of your know-it-all is gone. You become nothing. Christ becomes alive. You die in the heart. There it is. Because he dies, I live. When I I die, he he lives again. And when I die, he promised me life, and I died out to myself. So in order I can have his life, and how do I do it? By taking his not getting humility and then seed. I put his seed in here by faith and believe it, and then it produces exactly what the Bible says. Otherwise, if you got like that's now notice the beautiful wording Brother Brown uses here because he says, when the word of God becomes so preeminent in your heart. And when you have died out so much to yourself that you have become nothing in your own eyes, then humility comes, then, humility then power comes, then vision comes. So don't expect them you become until you are first come to life. died. You die. This is heart. There it is. Because he died, I live. You cannot expect even die, humility he until you come to the place where you are die, in your own eyes. And I died out to myself so in order I can have Now you might be nothing in your wife by taking Or you might be nothing in your neighbor. Put his seed in here by faith and believe it and then it produces exactly what the Bible says. 
If you got like that's enough. Now, now notice the beautiful word wording, brother Brown uses here because now, it says, humility. "When the word of God becomes so preeminent in your heart, any humility you have before you died yourself is a false that you have become nothing in your own put on and shame. So the entire key of living the life of Christ is first. Then you have to die yourself totally. So brother Brown said, "Not only die but rot until you are first and become nothing in your own eyes." Not nothing in the eyes of others, not dead to self in the eyes of others, but dead to self in your, in your own eyes. The Pharisees would play at and they could fool almost everyone into thinking that they were righteous and totally yielded to God, but they did not fool Jesus, they did not fool God. And let's face it, they will not fool the bride of Christ either. Now let's examine this true form of humility as seen in the firstborn Son of God, which is Jesus, as is he said, Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of him himself. You have to die to self totally. There wasn't the disciple that died rot. It was Jesus talking. I can't do nothing. Like Brother Branham. You know, I'm, I'm waiting for him. I, I, I'm helpless. I'm helpless. I'm a nobody. I'm nothing. Until he takes over. Verily, verily, as he entered, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do, for what things soever he, the father, doeth, these also doeth the son likewise, which means in the same way or manner. So Jesus told the people he needed to see a vision of God, his father, performing what he then stepped into that vision to do only what he seen the father do. You know, that's like our children. Dads, you know, you work in the shop, the boys grow up, they work in the shop with you. Dad uses this tool to do this thing, right? And Silas uses the same tool that his daddy uses. Jesus just following in his father's footsteps, showing complete dependency upon the father. That's the family. Like when he told us that the hat had to be on the chair, Brother Branham, and the woman had to be in a certain, certain chair, and the man had to be, uh, whose hat had to be on a certain chair, and he had to be in a certain chair as well. And he told us <clears throat> that he waited many, many hours for that hat to be on that chair before he could have the assurance that the vision was now unfolding. And then, of course, the laying hands on the person, uh, and then he laid hands on the person, then he could pronounce with certainty, thus saith the Lord, because everything to the T was done. Again, we see Jesus in 5.30, John 5, St. John 5.30, tell us the same thing. He says, I can of mine own self do nothing. Now, when's the last time you heard a minister say, I can do nothing? When's the last time you heard anybody say, I can do nothing? When's the last time you heard someone who plays the piano beautifully for the Lord say, hey, I... I can do nothing. Honestly. It's a gift. A brother from Australia sent me a, a video of a boy that was born with some type of a Down syndrome or something. He was uh, very retarded. Didn't even know how old he was. This boy now is 31 years old. And in a concert The boy is, it's either autistic or something, but he's just very, very, he, he's just not, he's very dysfunctional as far as communication. But this boy has a true gift from God, like Mozart and some of those great composers did. And this boy, in a great audience, he said, what would you like me to play? And somebody said some concerto. And he said, okay. In what key? Somebody said key of G. Okay. In what format? Another man stands up. Ragtime. So he took this beautiful piece of work done by, I don't know the composer, in a key that it wasn't written in, in ragtime, with no rehearsal, didn't even know what was going to be asked, and he played it. That is truly 
a gift from God because not only is that boy out of the way mentally as far as communication and, and what you and I would call being normal he was not that's a gift brother Branham said a gift is not pushing and pulling a gift is being able to yield yourself to the Holy Spirit and get yourself totally out of the way so you see Jesus say the same thing I can't of my own self do nothing I'm admitting hey I can't heal I can't save I can't do anything when I preach I falter uh, I just can't do it Jesus making himself nothing it's not him making himself nothing he's admitting what he is truly a vessel in the hands of a mighty God he says as I hear hear what faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God right? there says, as I hear I judge and what he is using as his standard to judge what he hears it's the word of God John told us to try every spirit to see whether it be of God and we are commanded to try all things by the word of God there is your standard for judging as I hear I judge he says and then he tells us he knows his judgment will be right because he says, and, and, and my judgment is just, my judgment is right, because I seek not mine own will. Because I am totally in neutral. I have died to myself, I seek not mine own will, and thus I have no stake in the game, I have no profit in the outcome. Whatever God wills to do, I am totally open to the, out, to the outcome according to his will, and not what I hope the outcome will be, and that is exactly what he's saying when he says, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. In this verse we find out why the Son of God could of himself do nothing. Because he tells us that he does not seek his own will, but the will of the Father that sent him. And so he, <clears throat> we could just let our own will go, and, and, and if we could just let our own will go, and to know the will of the Father, and to learn his will, we could then easily get ourselves out of the way so that God could use us as he used his own son, Jesus. Now, the definition of the word will means the mental faculty by which one deliberately chooses or decides upon a course of action. In other words, a volition. Your will is what you desire. It is your purpose. It is your determination. And it is your deliberate intention of what you wish. So you can see that if, if you can die to self, it is because you are able to die to your own ambition. You are able to die to your own purpose and your own wishes. And when, and when you can do that, you have slipped into neutral and your will is no longer, of, it, it, it is no longer your own. But you have become completely dependent upon God to move and guide you in whatever turn your life will take. That's the advice Brother Vale used to give us. He said, if you want to know God's will on something, he said, get yourself totally neutral. Totally neutral. You know, when a car is put in neutral, you can push it forward, you can push it backward. The car doesn't push itself. Now, if it's in drive, it's not going to go anywhere. And if it's in reverse, engine off, it's not going to go anywhere. It's stuck. And if you are stuck on your own thinking about something, how you want it done, God can't help you, I'm sorry. But when you get to the place where you totally get neutral with God and say, Lord, whatever your will, I'm willing to do. Not my will, but thy will be done. If you want me to go over here, I'll go over here. If you want me to go over here, I'll go over here. I'm totally open. I'm totally neutral, Father. Now God can get you someplace. <clears throat> we saw this work in the life of William Branham. as like no other person in the history of mankind outside of Jesus Christ. There were more healings done in one of his services than, than in the entire lifetime of most men who claimed a healing ministry. In fact, one historian of the healing revival said that uh, you could place William Branham on one side and all others combined on the other side, and William Branham's ministry would outweigh them all. And so we should ask ourselves, why is that? And the answer is simple, because William Branham had a gift from God to get himself out of the way, just as the Son of God, Jesus Christ, had the same gift to get himself out of the way. And God has given you the potential of that same gift. You know that? It's called the Holy Ghost. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. 
You know, people say, oh, that's a great, great, great mountain. That mountain is not even a speck in the size of the universe that God created. So who's greater, God or the, or the mountain? Your troubles or the God who created the entire universe? We limit him so often. In fact, Brother Brown taught us that the real gift that he had from God was not the ability to pray, because we can all pray. He said the real gift was to be able to get William Branham out of the way so that God could use him for whatever purpose God chose to use him. He said a gift is to get yourself out of the way so God can come in and use your body. From the message, God is his own interpreter, Brother Bram said. What is a gift? Not something you take and chop and turn. No, no. It's nothing. It's knowing how to get yourself out of the way that God can use you. A gift is only getting yourself, then God uses it. Or get yourself out, then God uses it. A gift is knowing how to get yourself out of the way and let God do what he wants to do. See, Brother Bram said in his sermon, Paradox, he said, a, a gift of faith is not something you take and do something with. A gift of faith is you, know, is you just get yourself out of the way. The gift is getting yourself, your own self, out of the way. So the gift of faith is having a revelation that God will do it. And then if God will do it, it is not you doing, then God is doing. But on the contrary, it is God doing it first, then you just step into what God has already done. See, so many people think, well, if I just do this, if I just, you know, do this, God will, God will come in and, and he'll do it for me. No, it's, it's not how it works. It's knowing God is doing it already. And you just step in. Then, look, it's, it's like, and I, I don't want to make this, it, it's a very bad comparison, but let me just say this. It's like what we have in the... Uh, you know, the, the man Trump, okay, he comes along, he, 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 he uh, becomes the messenger of the people's thoughts, people's voice. Then other people like Bannon and people jump on the bandwagon, and then they want to manipulate the man. People want to manipulate God in the same way. Well, God, you gave me this great ministry, so I'm going to do this and this and this and this and this. Come on, God, come along with me. Don't work that way. And when you get to thinking that, you will be totally destroyed just like the man Bannon has been. Because the way up is down, and the way down is up. Brother Bram said in the paragraph, a gift of faith, so we're still talking faith, is not something you take and do something with. A gift of faith is you just get yourself out of the way. The gift is getting yourself out of the way. So the gift of faith is having a revelation that God will do it. And then if God will do it, it is not you doing and then God doing, but on the contrary, it is God doing it first, then you just step into what God has done and watch the vision unfold from vision to manifested word. If people want to go along for the ride, I'm sure God has no problem with that. But when you try to insert yourself and say, God, come along with me, forget it. You're done. It's knowing how to relax yourself in such a way that God can use your body in a way that he wants to use your body. Just get yourself out of the way and watch. I wish that I could explain it better, but there, there isn't any way to make you understand it unless you have been there and actually seen it happen in your own life. And I hope that every one of you has had an experience or two or more where you've seen that you got yourself out of the way totally and then God took over. Now the best explanation I can give you is that it's just like shifting your car and getting it into gear and we've already gone over that. But if the brakes are on then the car cannot be moved forward, it cannot be moved backwards. That's why Brother Brown told us that the fivefold gifts to the church are just the gift to get yourself out of the way. So God can use the body to preach. God can use the body to teach according to the measure of the gift predestinated within. And from his sermon, What is the Works of God? He said, Brother Brown said, Now, there is a thing, knowing how to yield yourself. And some people are set in the church. Some can yield themselves to preaching. Some can yield themselves easily to teaching. Some can yield themselves to prophesying. Some can yield themselves to other gifts. 
So all the gifts won't be alike. They wasn't alike then. Paul said they wasn't. But each man is called and placed into the church for a purpose. And if you'll find out what God can use him best at and yield yourself to that place, he will be a success. Now listen, I will rightly admit I have not had much success as a pastor. I've tried for 36 years to be as good a pastor as I know how to be. But my temperament is perhaps too hard, too cutting, too critical, and it's caused some hurt along the way. But when I yielded myself to the Holy Spirit and went overseas to teach the ministers this wonderful revelation of Jesus Christ doing the work of an apostle, the ministry flourished everywhere and the fruit of the ministry can be seen all over the world in the lives of ministers who've taken this revelation of Jesus Christ and they've stepped into this revelation and have become living epistles of Christ to the congregations. And my purpose for bringing the brothers over here at least one a year is to show you this, that these brothers have caught the same revelation that you've caught. And it's very effica efficacious overseas. That's the fruits of the ministry. We don't have a, a, a very large fruit orchard here in Ohio, but we have 122 IP addresses streaming our services live, over 56 cities in 11 different countries, and that's just streaming. The sermons in written format have been translated into 11 languages where brethren may not be able to stream because they don't understand the English language. And if you go to, those, if you go to the little map and you see all over Brazil. They're not streaming because they can understand English. They're watching our service live and the brother, Brother Diogenes, is actually translating word for word. He takes the sermons before and he translates word for word. And so they're actually hearing his voice, but they're watching the service. Okay? That takes me out of it. It's the Holy Spirit. Eleven languages where brethren are not able to stream because they don't understand the English language, but others are taking those sermons and preaching them in their own language, and believers are watching their streaming service and getting the same messages. So the ministry is being echoed and magnified in ways I never expected would happen. These brethren are seeing results in their own countries, and that's the fruits of the, uh, the apostle ministry. Yet the fruits of my pastoral ministry seem to be very minimal but not so, not so unlike others like Paul and John and, and ministries that went into the world but whom as they as pastors had around a dozen or so believers in their local church that they preached to. Paul had a dozen people in Ephesus. Don't ever forget that. You know, the American way is to, is to, uh, to evaluate something on the, uh, by mass numbers. You know, if, if there's a great number of people, it must be successful. No, not with God many more of the children of the harlot than she which has a husband. But although Brother Branham's international ministry well exceeded his local ministry, yet the real fruit of his ministry can be found all over the world. Brother Neville pastored the local flock and his sermons were very pastoral. Then Brother Collins for four or three years and his sermons were very pastoral as well. In Brother Vale's ministry, we saw the same thing. His ministry had more effect around the world than it did in St. Paris. But he had someone else to pastor as well. And Paul had Timothy to pastor for him as, as his ministry took him to other places as well. And although Paul's ministry was accepted by many around the world, yet locally there were only 12 that could set directly under him. Why? It could be because his preaching was fiery. It, maybe his preaching was biting. But I'd rather believe that it was because there's only 12 that were predestinated to be there. And although you people have put up with my hard and critical preaching and teaching, Yet I do not believe it is me that you're hearing and putting up with. I believe it's the him, him that sent me. Amen. That's what Brother Brown tells us in his sermon. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He said, it's not the preacher that preaches. It's God preaching through him. It's not the prophet that sees the vision. It's God speaking through him. I do nothing except the Father shows me first what to do. Now notice after he says it's not the preacher that preaches, it's, not, it's God preaching through him. It's not the prophet that sees a vision, it's God speaking through him. Notice then he goes right into the scripture to show us the example in Jesus Christ himself in John 5, 19, I do nothing except the Father show me first what to do. Now if I were just doing the work of pastor, I would never focus on anything outside the walls of this church and its people. 
But that's not what I was called to do. In 1983, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and wrote to me, uh, uh, told me to write down my sermons word for word, and one day they would be read all over the world. I didn't understand what he meant by that, but I did what he told me to do. And I had no understanding how God would accomplish what he said because that was way before the internet was available. Then in 1997, I began to post doctrinal teachings to the internet because I saw there was nothing on the internet that taught what Brother Branham actually taught. You know, the oneness said Brother Branham was a trinity. The trinity said Brother Branham was a oneness. Nobody understood what he taught. And so we, we put up the Godhead. We put up the, the presence. We put up the twins and, and, and some of the studies. <clears throat> and after about a year, from a brother from Africa began to request my sermons as well. I didn't have the finances to send out my sermons, so I figured, I mean, look, it was a dollar a tape just to send it just to send it plus the cost of the materials themselves and you start multiplying that times how many times I've preached I can't do that I don't have the funds for that so I went the economic way put it on the internet and it's free if they want they can have it they don't, they don't have to have it that was 20 years ago and God has taken these sermons into 11 languages, 189 countries since then. More than 1,358 of my sermons have been translated into 11 languages. In fact, Brother Mario sent me two more this morning, so we now have 500, 1,160 and 500, just in Spanish alone. So what I'm trying to say here is that Brother Bram, what Brother Bram is telling us in his sermon, What is the Works of God?, where he said, Now, there is a thing, knowing how to yield yourself. And some people is, is, is set in the church... Some can yield themselves to preaching. Some can yield themselves to teaching. Some can yield themselves to prophesying. Some can yield themselves to other gifts. So all the gifts won't be alike. They wasn't alike then. Paul, asked, uh, Paul said they wasn't. But each man is called and placed into the church for a purpose. And if you find out what God can use him best at and yield himself to that place, he will be successful. So you might ask, well, you know what? Sometimes you mention things and you, get, you, know, and, and you show the difference between this and this, and, and, and that doesn't even concern this little church. It doesn't. I'll admit, it doesn't. But it does around the world. And my ministry foremost is an apostle. I have, not, I have more success in that because I've yielded myself to that. Now, I've tried, like I said, for 36 years to, to, uh, to pastor and be faithful in pastoring. But my ministry is geared internationally. It's not geared for... Grace Fellowship Tabernacle. It's, it's geared for the bride of Jesus Christ. Brother Vales was. Brother Brown's was. That's the way Paul's was. John was. And when I yielded myself to do the work of an apostle, blessed God blessed that in such a way that I could never have done that on my own. But that is what he called me to do, and that is where I am most comfortable with. So as Brother Brown said in his sermon, Influence, he said, always keep humble and be little in your own sight. No matter what God does for you, just see how much humbler you can be all the time. The more God blesses you, just keep getting more humble all the time. He can continue to bless. But when you get to the place that you think, well, I've got it, you haven't got it, and you're on your road out. That's right, see? You lose your influence, you lose your strength of your testimony. And from Pergamian and church age, Brother Brown said, be little in the sight of God, be little in your own sight, and everybody else is above you. Let him, let him that's greatest among you be minister to all. Who could be greater than Jesus Christ who girded himself and washed the disciples' feet? A foot-washing flunky he become. The God of heaven, the, the creator of heavens and earth, washing dirty feet for fishermen. Oh, with manure and stuff and dust of the road where their garments had swept it up and washing it off. A foot-washing flunky is what he was. And, then he th and we think that we're somebody. We got to be a doctor, PhD, and so and so. Oh my, that ain't Christ. That don't display the lovely Jesus Christ. He becomes servant of all. That's right. Taught us an example that we should do to others, to one another, as He did unto us. Oh, that's my Lord. What makes Him big is because He made Himself little. See, that's what made Him big. Now, then it isn't you talking; it's Him talking. That's how, the Holy, that's how the gifts of God work in the body of Christ. You first get yourself out of the way so the Holy Spirit can operate within your body to use your body to do His will. 
For I'm a sermon, lean not unto your own understanding, Brother Bram said, a gift of God is, is, is some way to have of getting yourself out of the way. And, and gifts and callings are the predestination of God. Gifts and callings are even without repentance. You're born with it. A little gear that you pull yourself over into, uh, but you cannot step on, on the pedal. See? In other words, God starts to move you. Don't try to move ahead and go into fourth gear when God says, hey, one, first gear is fine. You're born with it, a little gear you pull yourself over into, but you cannot step on the pedal. See, God has to operate it. You have to get yourself out of the way. Now notice, God has to operate it, and that is what he said in the earlier quotes that we read, where he said, it's not the preacher that preaches, it's God preaching through him. It's not the prophet that sees the vision, it's God speaking through him. A brother Brown said his worst enemy was himself. And he said, God gave him a gift to get himself out of the way so that God could take over and use his body for the glory of God and to help, God, help God's children. Now, I think that we can all agree that Jesus Christ had the greatest gift of all from God to get himself out of the way. If you get a chance, listen this week, it's March 8th of 1960. It's a message called Discernment of Spirit. Brother Branham is saying, look, if, even if God showed me who would be the next president, he said, and, what, and, and, and so what if I told the people who the next president is going to be? And I gathered all the newsmen and news companies around and said, I'm going to tell you all who the next president is going to be. He said, what good would it do you? Wouldn't add a dime to you. He said, God, don't do things like that. So when you see all of these so-called people, religious prophets, they call themselves, Say, well, God told me two years before uh, the election that, 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 uh, that Donald Trump was going to be president. Brother Brown said, God don't do that. And you know why God don't do that? Brother Brown said, because that wouldn't give God glory. He said, that would give me glory. God don't want to give William Branham glory. He wants to give God glory. So don't do things like that. Don't say, well, you know, 10 years ago, I, I, you know, I was ahead of the schedule. And 10 years ago, I, I was ahead of everybody. And I saw this and that. Forget it. It's not about you. It's about him. It's totally, totally about him. He said in John 12, 49, For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father who sent me, he gave me commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. You talk about a totally yielded vessel. And he said in John 14, 31, But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. A total prisoner to God. As Paul said, I, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Again in John 15, 10, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my comm Father's commandments and abide in his love. Now, a few weeks ago, I showed you the, the scriptures that spoke of the Son of God as being God's great servant and that he was blind and deaf to all but God's word. We find in Isaiah 42 and 19, the scripture teaches us that the Son of God was blind to everything except God's word and he was deaf to everything but God himself. In, in the King James Version, we read, Who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my messenger that I sent? Who is blind as he that is perfect, and blind as the Lord's servant? Now, most people would read that with a totally lack of understanding. They say, a blind servant? What good is a blind servant? What good is a deaf servant? You got a servant that's blind and deaf? Well, get rid of him and get somebody that's got eyes and can see. And listen, they don't understand. He was blind to everything except for what God wanted him to say. The Rotherham translation puts it this way. Who is blind if not my servant? Or deaf like my messenger that I send? Who is, who is blind like an intimate friend is blind? Or blind like the servant of Yahweh? What does he mean by that? You've heard the expression love is blind? What does that mean? It means love doesn't look at, at, to criticize the spouse. Spouses don't criticize spouses. They shouldn't criticize spouses. They should be praying for spouses. Love is blind. You shouldn't be looking at the faults. I got in a 
a lot of trouble in the church in Minneapolis when I was up there because when I met my wife, my future wife, I said she's perfect. And I heard a sermon from the pulpit that, you know, no man is perfect and blah, blah, blah. Well, she was perfect in my eyes. Love is blind. And as Brother Brown said, or as Father Rotherham, who is blind like an intimate friend is blind. You ever have friends that, you know, there's certain things about them, you, you know, I mean, you just love to be around them, but there's certain things that they do that kind of, yeah, I wish they wouldn't do that. Maybe you got a preacher like, oh, I wish you wouldn't say those things, but you love them anyway. That's what he's saying here. Regardless, there's a love there. The Jerusalem Bible says, Who is blind as my servant, so who is so deaf as a messenger that I sent? In other words, it should read, Who in all the world is as blind as my servant, who is designed to be my messenger of truth, who is so blind as my dedicated one, the servant of the Lord. So dedicated that he only saw one man amidst 300 so dedicated that when the God showed him a vision of the one man he went looking for that one man and bypassed 300 people all crying out for help you say the compassion of Jesus his compassion was to do the will of God so we see here that Jesus was absolutely blind concerning anything that was contrary to God's word, God's will, and God's purpose. I hope that each one of us can put ourselves in his footsteps right there. And say, Lord, make me to the place where I'm absolutely so blind concerning anything that is contrary to your will, to your word, and to your purpose. So how do you get there? By focusing only on him. When you play football, if you're going to kick a field goal, many times the opposing fans will throw snowballs or in a warmer weather, maybe oranges, to try to distract your attention. So if you're going to be successful, you must learn to focus only on the placement of where the ball holder will place the ball and nothing else. <coughs> the golfer in the natural, he learns to so focus on that putt that he becomes blind to the audience and deaf to all the noise and all the distractions that would otherwise take his eyes off them. The best hitters in baseball are those who are so focused that they can tell you how many rotations the ball takes from the time it leaves the pitcher's hand until he swings his bat to hit it. So focused. Now, if he can do that in the natural, how much more should it be in the spiritual. Isaiah 42 and 19, who is blind? Who is so focused unto me that he is focused out, that he has focused out everything else? Who is blind but my servant? Or who is deaf? Who is tuned into me so much that he has tuned out everything else but me? as my messenger that I sent. Who is blind as he that is perfect and blind as the Lord's servant? Now, Brother Vale mentioned this scripture years ago and he brought out a friend of his that was uh, a man that was just a very, very bright man. He said he could sit on the plane or he could be in a, a diner and the music would be just funky and just, you know, just terrible music, ungodly music. And it wouldn't distract him because he didn't even hear it. Didn't even hear it. Oh, it was there. But he was so tuned out. He had so tuned out everything. And that's what God wants you and I. To come to that place where we can just totally tune out the world. And be tuned into him. From looking unto Jesus, Brother Ram said... Many people have the wrong impression about a gift. A gift is not something that God gives you to go out and say, well, here, I'll, I'll go over here and pick out this, pick out this, and, and I'll take that, and I'll, I'll do this. That's not a gift. So many people think that, but they're wrongly impressed. A gift of God is just to know how to get yourself out of the way so God can use you. That's all a gift is, see? As long as you're in yourself, didn't Jesus say himself, the Son can do nothing? 
Uh, St. John 5, 19, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself. He passed by that pool where all them cripples was and healed one man with prostrate trouble or something disease retarded, whatever. And he said, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he has seen the Father do, that doeth the Son likewise. It's not me, he said, that doeth the works. It's my Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Now, that illustration Brother Bram gave us of Jesus walking to the pool of Bethesda and seeing one man going to, through a crowd of 300 people going to just that one person. Let me just say this. You sisters that have had children and that child decides to run off in the, in the department store. And, all, and you were busy looking at a tag or something and all of a sudden they're gone. What do you do? You focus out everything, every person, and your focus is totally on this little tyke with this color hair, with this sound of her voice, and you're listening. All your attributes of your five senses are listening. Where is that little kid? And you're looking for a certain size, certain shape. You're not looking for a you know, you're looking, and you're not even looking at the people next to you. You're looking, you're focused. And that is what we're talking about. Jesus saw the vision of one person. And when he went through the 300, it's not that he didn't see the 300, but he, he's filtering, filtering, filtering. Ah, there he is back there. I see him back there. The one that I saw in the vision, I see back there. And that's what he did. Only what the Father showed him to do. From a sermon, God's provided place or God's provided way, Brother Branham said, what is a gift anyhow? Not to take something and use something and say, well, I got a gift of healing. I go out and heal this one and heal that one. If I, if I could, I certainly do it. But it's but a gift. You misunderstand, you misinterpret a gift. A gift is just get yourself out of the way and let the Holy Spirit use you. See, that's the gift. That's what a minister is. He don't preach what he wants to preach. He just gets himself out of the way. It's a gift. And inspiration comes and he speaks through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Any other gift is the same way. That is why people can be listening to tapes during the week and come to church and find the preacher saying the very same things they heard on the tapes. Because it's not the preacher. It is God confirming what you heard on the tape. And in the mouth of two or three witnesses, he's establishing his word in you. You say, what a great man I am. I listen to a tape and then the preacher preaches the same thing. No. What a great God God is. That God can preach it on this tape and he can preach it here and he can preach it in the pulpit. And he's getting... And what, who's it for? It's for you. It's for you. <clears throat> Years ago, we had a sister got offended because I, I said, you know, parents, you should be have more control of your children. You should watch what kind of things they put on their walls. Are they putting posters of, of uh, sports figures or this and that? I said, that's not, that's not right. It's leading down the wrong direction. And after Sir, she came up, she says, how dare you speak about my son's bedroom? I said, when have I ever been in your son's bedroom? Huh? I have no clue your son had pictures in his bedroom on his walls. I've never been in his bedroom. People got to get their eyes off the vessel. Because the gift isn't the vessel. The gift is God in operation. Paul wrote in Ephesians 2 and 1, And you hath he quickened, that means to make alive, you who were dead in trespasses and sins. And we know that sin is unbelief. And the Bible tells us that they sin because they believe not. So drinking, smoking, gambling, chasing is not sin. They're just attributes of unbelief. But people who do those things, they don't believe God's word. If they believe God's word, they wouldn't do those things. Now notice what the Apostle Paul said in Colossians 2 and 13. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Now when you become born again by the word of God, if you die out to the world and the cares of the world and you become a new creation in Christ Jesus, all things are passed away and all things are become new. 
He quickens. And when he quickens, he's forgiven your trespasses. Let's turn in our Bibles to see how Paul describes this process in Romans 6 and 1. He said, what should we then say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead uh, by the glory of God, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in, in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is free, freed from sin. And now if, 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 if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we, have, we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath, uh, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died once unto sin, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God. See, that's your choice. Who am I going to yield to? As those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin? Because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know you not that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey. Whether, you yield, whether, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were once the servant, uh, that you were... Uh, that you were the servants of sin, but, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Uh, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Now, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of our flesh. For as you have yielded your member servants to uncleanness and to iniquity, unto in iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when you were servants of sin, you were free from, the, from, from righteousness, uh, what, what fruit had you then in those things where we, where, whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end thereof everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, when we are born again, we talk in other language altogether. We don't talk like the world because we don't think like the world. Paul said in Ephesians 4.22 that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And if we are born again, that means that we have died out to self, and, and, and the way that we treat others is different than the world will treat them. Paul said in Colossians 3.9, Lie not one to another, brethren, seeing that, that you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Notice that the new man is renewed by the knowledge of him. And the more that we know of him, the more we bring ourselves and our will under the control of him for his glory. Notice, for his glory, his doxa. In 2 Corinthians 5 and 14, it tells us, For the love of Christ constraineth us. That means the love of Christ is a motivating factor that re restrains you and inhibits you from doing what you want to do. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then all were dead. In other words, if it, were not, if it were not for him, then I might as well be dead. And there is no hope for me. But since he died for me, then I owe him my life and my being, and my very mind, my soul, and my heart. And because he first loved me, I am able to love him in return. We've all seen examples through, maybe through books we've read and movies we've seen, where, say, uh, it might be... Uh, uh, an Indian, or it might be uh, someone in the old days, but when somebody saved their life, they were now indebted to that person the rest of their life. Well, God has saved yours. Yeah. Amen. Okay. All right.
then how do we know Christ? By his spirit that lives in us. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Uh, creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things uh, are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, what is this ministry of reconciliation? It is a doctrine of Christ, teaching others the revelation of Jesus Christ that they might also receive his spirit, thus reconciling them also to God through Christ. As Brother Ram said, the greatest gift, the greatest gift, he said, there's nothing greater. The greatest, or the greatest works of God, he said, is imparting life. How do you do it? By giving them the word of life. When they receive the word of life, the Holy Spirit will come in. Now, in the next verse, Paul is going to explain how that God gave Jesus the ministry of reconciliation and how we also receive the same ministry of reconciliation. He says, to wit... That means to this end or for this purpose or accordingly that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, if Jesus has committed unto us the word of reconciliation, then that word is to be in us as it was in Christ. Right? Then another point Paul makes here, which I just caught last night as I was going through this. But in order to reconcile, he has to not focus on the sin, but on the revelation of sons. Paul said, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Now think about that. How are you going to reconcile them? You don't talk about their sin. You don't impute their trespasses unto them. And I just caught that. And I'll admit, I've come short on that. So I need to begin doing this. How do we enter into the ministry of reconciliation? First, we have got to come to the place where we do not focus on the person's faults or mistakes, but focus only on Christ. Not on the sins of the person, and then in pointing the people, but pointing the people to Christ and the cross. And the revelation of Jesus Christ as firstborn sons and a vast family of brothers. Then if they are predestinated to it, they will, they will leave behind the old man and become new creatures or new creations in Christ. So then he goes on and says, Now, then we are ambassadors, representatives for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So see, when we are willing to step a side of self, and to die to self, God is more than willing to come in and to live in us. Now, if God comes in and lives his life out through your mortal body, then it is no more you that is living, but Christ is living in you. Then you could no more die than God could die. Then you, you have a great reassurance, a great assurance of life eternally with him and with those that are in Christ. In Colossians 2 and 12 tells us, buried with him in baptism, wherein we are, uh, you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. Now the word operation is the Greek word energia, which speaks of the energy of God working in you. Therefore he says, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the revealing of the energy of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins and, and uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened, that means he's made alive, together with him, having forgiven you all Tress passes. There it is again. And look at the benefit we receive by dying out to self. Your old man is completely obliterated. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was once against us, which was contrary to us, and took it, and took out, took it out of the way and nailing it to the cross, his cross. Then all your sin, all your unbelief, every bad deed you ever did and ever will do was nailed to his cross and is buried under the blood of the Lamb. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, For as an Adam all die, so even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Then only through Christ can we be made alive. Here we are told that all who live through Adam, in other words, through, through mere flesh and blood reproduction, since we are born after the flesh, we must all die as well. But through Christ we are all made alive, which means that only by Christ is it possible to live forever. Because there is only one form of eternal life, and that is God's life. 
God is the only one that is eternal, and therefore, for us to become eternal beings, it is essential that the very life of God entered into us and has taken over our mortal being, bringing, our, bringing on immortality to us. We're getting ready to close here. Let me just read from Galatians 2 and 19. For I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. I am, notice I am his present tense, I am crucified with Christ. And if I am is present tense thing, then I am 24-7 being crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I that is living, but now it is Christ living in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I am living by the faith, the revelation of the Son of God, not my faith in the Son of God, but the faith of the Son of God, his faith that he had in God, I am now living by that same faith. What was that faith? I am the Son of God. What's your faith? I am the Son of God. Who loved me and gave himself for me, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. God has got to do something with you before he could place his Holy Spirit in you. And if we now live by the same faith that Jesus had, then it is not what you can do, nor is it what you cannot do, but rather it is what he has already done for you. Then you learn to rest in his promise uh, to you, and this rest makes you so relaxed in him. And let's face it, how could you rest if you don't have trust in his promise? So, so as you trust his word, you learn to, to rest and relax in it until you just die out to your old way of thinking and you just become dead to yourself because if you are not willing to die out to self, he will never place his spirit in your vessel. Life comes from, uh, from living substance, uh, excuse me, life, from, uh, life comes from living on dead substance and out of death comes life. And every fall the earth dies out, the life in the plant goes down into the burial chamber of the roots of the plant, but in the spring, out of that burial chamber of the roots comes up the life into the plant again and the life begins to manifest itself again. And out of the death of Christ came forth a resurrection out from among the dead, the resurrection of life. And the only way that you can become alive in God is to die out to yourself and your symptoms and everything around you and become alive in Christ the Word. You've got to die out to self. You've got to die out to your symptoms. You've got to die out to the circumstances. You've got to die out to everything else and become alive in Christ. And from his sermon, you must be born again, Brother Brown said, if you're born of God, you're washed in the waters of the word, separated from the things of the world, and believe God. You're dead. You're dead to your own thinking. You're dead to your own ideas. You're dead to everything else but God's word. It lives in you, working back through you, proving that it is God's word. You say, I'm dead to the world, I'm dead to the world, Brother Branham, and deny God's word. And from his sermon investments, said, using not our own mind, but just letting his mind, we're prisoners as Paul, as Peter, no matter what anyone else says, you're imprisoned to that word. The Holy Spirit leads. He forbids you to go places. He forbids you to come here. He sends you to places you would not go and keeps you away from places that you would go. Do you want a policy? Do you want to make an investment? In other words, hey, that's what I want. And from a sermon, Forsaking All, Brother Brown said, the scripture says, he that loves the world or the things of the world, the love of God is not even in him. That's right. It takes forsaking all. There, there when you were willing to forsake all and follow him, then if you abide in me, my word in you, you ask what you will and it will be done for you. But you cannot, knowing that those things are wrong, you know that they're wrong. The Bible is against them. Playing cards, uh, cigarette smoking, drinking, wearing immoral clothes, and then claiming to be a Christian. If that spirit is in you, does not condemn that, then there's something wrong with the spirit that's in you. Because the God who wrote the word is the word, and the word is in you, and it condemns you. It's got to. And if it doesn't, you're being deceived. Like the scripture says, if you be any otherwise minded, God will reveal it to you. Sometimes you might say something, and the Holy Spirit come along and quick and say, you shouldn't have said that. Or you shouldn't have said it that way. I've heard Brother Branham on tape tell us the same thing. There's many times that, that I've said something, I say, you know, the Holy Spirit should stop me. You shouldn't say that. Okay? How can the Holy Spirit write something and you turn around and do contrary to it and say the Holy Spirit's leading you? You can't do it. You must for, forsake your own ideas. You must cope with his word. And never will the Holy Ghost ever deny any word it ever spoke, and the Bible is wrote by the Holy Spirit. The Bible said so. And if the Bible's word, <clears throat> Bible words is God, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word is made of flesh and dwell among us. Now, the Word is made spirit dwelling in us. 
for I will be with you even in you to the end of the world, the consummation. Now, if that same God that wrote the Bible is in you, you're not your own. You're dead to the things of the world. You're, you're dead to your own thoughts. And the mind that was in Christ be in you, then, then you're forsaking all to follow him. Not your own thoughts. It's what he says. Not my will, thine will, Lord. Then you begin to line up with God's word. And from Hebrews chapter 10, and we'll close. Brother Brown said, having therefore, brethren, boldness, I mean, uh, Paul says, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promise. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully, that means if we disbelieve willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. <clears throat> let's just pray. Gracious Father, we want to thank you, Lord. And now, Father, we've We've read the mechanics, O oh God, of what it takes to be your servant, of what it takes to allow you to preach through us, teach through us, talk through us, live through us, do your work through us. We've read the mechanics, O oh God. And we know and we understand the mechanics, Father, that they are all made possible by just simply dying to self. Just dying. Totally, totally dead to our own opinion of self. We have no opinion of self. Totally, totally, totally dead. But we're living with a focus. And that focus is you. And that focus is your children. And that focus is how that we can bring you to your children. And we have the pattern in your son, the firstborn the eldest brother in a vast family of brothers. So Father, help us, <clears throat> help us, Lord. As Brother Branham talked about, the great gift of faith is to get ourselves out of the way. That's what faith is all about. It's about your word, what you've said. It's not about the circumstances. It's not about all the situations around us. It's simply about one thing. What did you say about it? And that's the gift of faith, is to yield and to let go, and to let God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's just sing that song, um, Down From My Heart, The World and All. I think that's uh, three. See, it's, I love, it's, it's I Love Him. Yeah, it's 372 in the uh, hymnals, if you have it. <clears throat> Gone from my heart The world and its charm gone are my sins and all that would alarm gone evermore and by his grace I know the precious blood of Jesus cleanses white as snow. I love him. I love him because he love me <clears throat> I
and purchase my salvation on Calvary Tree. Can we take this down a little bit? Once I was lost Away down deep in sin Once was a slave To doubts and fears within Once was afraid to trust a loving God But now my guilt is washed away In Jesus' blood I love Him I love Him because He first loved me. And purchased my salvation on Calvary's <clears throat> tree. Once I was bound, but now I am set free. Once I was blind, but now the light I see. Once I was dead, but now in Christ I live to tell the world the peace that he alone can give. Ah.